of the Lord. Uh, glad to be home. Glad to uh, be around the saints. I, I don't want to waste any time. Uh, Matthew, the sixth chapter. Uh, let's jump right in. We started and did an introduction on last week uh, on a title from a book called The God First Life. And I just wanted to take a minute. Uh, because if you have not purchased this book, I would encourage you to. It's one that you want to add to your library. Uh, it is where we'll be teaching from. I don't teach verbatim uh, from it, but I digest it and try to make it palatable for the folks that I serve. Amen. And so this is what the book actually looks like. Uh, the God First Life. Uh, and it also has a study guide uh, for those that want to dig a little bit deeper I'm using some of this material as well uh, and you know uh, I'm, I'm a, a book nerd uh, so there was also a 40-day devotional I had to grab that too uh, and for those that that don't like buying books I I, I don't know what to tell you uh, because if you don't invest in yourself ain't nobody else gonna invest in you and so I don't just have the the, uh, the uh, written, I have the audio uh, and the Kindle. It's got to be with me wherever I go. Uh, and that is how you digest. Uh, I can listen to it, go back, read it, highlight it, give me a little quick daily devotional word in, go to the study guide, do some more work. Uh, if you don't fall in love with the text, uh, you will never be able to grow in God. I'll say that again. If you don't fall in love with the text, uh, you will never really be able to grow in God because you will be feeding uh, off of other folks' meals. Uh, it was never cool to me. Uh, I'm eating a big old In-N-Out hamburger. I, I'm not talking about my wife. I'm talking about other people uh, that would come and say, let me get a bite. No, you can't, you can't get a bite of this. I'm sorry, I may give you a few of these french fries, uh, but you're not biting my hamburger. It's interesting because when we think of, of how we grow spiritually, we eat on the word of God. Uh, but many of us will only eat on a word that somebody else has already digested. Uh, you, won't, you won't go chew your own word. Uh, see, to be able to chew the word means to take the text apart and find out what the Bible is really saying about the text. That's chewing the text. Uh, if you just go and swallow the text, uh, then you swallow it whole. and You really don't get the nutrients out of it because God gave us teeth to break the food down so that when it goes into the body, the body can extract the nutrients that it needs uh, to be able to function and then flush the rest out. But when you swallow something whole, a lot of times the body doesn't have enough acid within itself to be able to break it down so it comes out whole. <laughs> how are you digesting the word of God? How, how are you studying the word of God? Uh, do you take the time to find out where the word comes from? What is the Hebrew, Greek, or Chaldean uh, definition for the word? What does the comma mean? Why is there a semicolon there? Uh, do we pause when we see a comma? Uh, do we really deal with the Bible from a literal standpoint, uh, from literature, and then try to take it and apply it to our everyday life? It is not just a story. It is life-changing. Oh, God is quiet tonight. All right. All right. And so we have to uh, stop looking at, at the Bible and church, uh, the Bible as a story and church uh, as, as something that we uh, would look at like entertainment, uh, where we go to a concert, we're entertained. That was a good concert. We go home. Uh, we come to church. We had great praise and worship. Uh, there was a good word, but you didn't digest any of it. It ought to be life-changing every time you come in contact with it. And if your mind is not set up like that, then what's going to happen uh, is when you hear God, it's like hearing the radio. 
It was just the next thing that went through the passage of your mind, and it really didn't have any impact. It might have made you think about some things, but you didn't really digest it. Look at somebody and tell them, you got to chew your food. You remember at the dinner table, for, for those of us that grew up in those kinds of homes uh, where the TV wasn't on, and we were at the, I know I'm talking crazy for some of y'all, and we were at the dinner table, uh, we were glad to get to Friday, because Friday we pull out the TV trays and we go in the den. I know this is Spanish for a lot of people. And we go in the den and we'd eat dinner in front of the TV. But every other night, uh, and it was Fish Friday. Y'all ain't saying nothing. <laughs> Hallelujah. Daddy would send me to the fish mart with $20 to get some fish. And that was the day that we kicked it. But every other day, we were at the dinner table. And we would have conversation at the dinner table. But mother would always say, chew your food. Because we was trying to hurry up and get away from the dinner table so we could go play Atari. <laughs> yeah, I just dated myself. Y'all don't know about that. Atari and ColecoVision. <laughs> Where the cartridge was half the size of your hand. When it didn't work, you had to take it out and blow it. <laughs> Matthew chapter 6. Verse 33, I don't know about y'all, but I wasn't ready for this heat. <laughs> Matthew 6, 33, the Bible reads, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Uh, we'll, we'll pause there because when we pick up the study of this particular uh, series, The God First Life, uh, it's centered around this thought of my life, God's way. Uh, say that with me, my life, God's way. It's simply put that uh, you got to come off the throne. And I think that's one of the most hardest things to do is to take yourself off the throne and put God there. In theory, we think it's easy to do. But reality says you are in the way. I don't want to deal with the devil. I don't want to deal with circumstance and situation. I just want to deal with us because we are the greatest challenge in stopping uh, our relationship with God it's not the devil it's us uh, because we uh, have some thoughts we have some ways we've done some stuff and because of that it is our mind now that is challenged uh, when it comes to having a relationship with God uh, and even after having a relationship with God, uh, there's always questions, there's always things that come up. But then there's this thing called the process to maturity uh, that we have to go through to be able to get closer to God to enhance the relationship. And unfortunately, we've made it difficult uh, because uh, we put a lot of stuff on top of Scripture that shouldn't be there. Uh, we put a lot of rules and regulations. We put a lot of religion. We put a lot of stuff on top of the Bible. Uh, and so now it becomes difficult because we got to navigate through all this extra stuff really to do the simple thing that God wants us to do. Salvation is so simple uh, that we don't think that it could possibly be like that so that's why we add stuff. If the Bible says, confess and believe and you shall be saved, why are we trying to add all this other stuff to it? <laughs> and we try to, we try to uh, put people in God and put people out of God when we really don't have no room to do that. 
and we put expectations on people a lot of times that we don't put on ourselves. Because you have uh, declared that you are a Christian, that you are a believer, automatically people think that you should be a certain way, do a certain thing. But do they really understand what the Bible says about our lives and what we're supposed to be doing? I doubt it. I doubt it. Because if they really knew that salvation really wasn't about a bunch of do's and don'ts, salvation is really about promises. That God has promised us some things if we, <laughs> that, that's the key, if we uh, submit to his will. There are promises. I don't look at them as rules. I look at them as promises. So before we even get to, to 6 and 33, I want to draw your attention. You don't have to find it. But the Bible says, if my people. Why does he start the sentence with if? Because the promise is not really predicated upon God doing something. No, this bless my life because most of the time we're waiting on the Lord. We're waiting on the Lord. We're waiting on the Lord. But the truth of the matter is, is God is waiting on us. He's waiting on us. The, the, the truth is God has already done. The problem is, is we haven't attained the knowledge to find out what he wants us to do so that he can respond. One of the challenges in the church right now is individuals not getting God to respond to them the way they desire. Because they want God to respond to them, but they don't want to do the due diligence it takes to be able to get a response. And so if you walk into a room and, and, and you don't speak in my family, uh, we're going to look at you like you stole something. Did you just walk up in here and because we uh, demand a certain level of respect and appreciation for one another? Why do you think you can walk into the presence of God and not acknowledge him? It, 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 you're going to have problems. Oh, yeah, God's going to, oh, you're going to act like I'm not here. You're going to act like I don't exist. We're trying to make God and our relationship difficult, but really it's just as simple as the people that you deal with every day. He's just a supreme being. He is the supreme being. He's God all by himself. And if we know how to acknowledge people, why wouldn't we acknowledge him? Uh, you can have a car and you can have a great mechanic. And another mechanic might be able to fix it temporarily. Uh, but wait till one of them factory made parts break. And I don't care what you do. There will be no aftermarket part. You will have to go to the dealer, the original creator of the car, to be able to get the car fixed. And fool around and find the part. And then you won't have the tool necessary to be able to put the part in. Because the dealer never sold that tool to anybody. I've been in that state. I've been in that state. And so I took my car to a mechanic. He couldn't fix the car. He got the part, but he didn't have the tool. And the dealer wasn't giving up the tool. So after I spent the money with the mechanic, I had to tow the car to the dealer so that the dealer could take the tool. The problem was they wouldn't take the part that I bought because they couldn't guarantee it. <laughs> Y'all ain't hear me in here. When God is trying to fix you, he don't want you to go to a whole lot of different people and a whole lot of different situations. He wants you to come to him. And sometimes you'll even try to go to God's people, but God's people are like neon signs. <laughs> He's over there. That's what God's people do. We point people to God because sooner or later, you're going to have to have a conversation with him. And it's going to be you and him. And nobody's going to be able uh, to petition on your behalf because it's already been done. Jesus has already petitioned on your behalf. And that's why you got access. That's why the Bible says no man coming to the Father but through him. 
Jesus. We can only get to God through Jesus. So why are we trying to hook up with other people to try to find out about somebody that we need to go talk to by ourselves? Look at somebody and just ask them, when the last time you talked to him? Well, don't make no sense in getting on the phone and fussing. Don't make no sense of getting on Facebook. I'm irritated. Don't make no sense of doing all this stuff. You know, you need to go straight to the manufacturer. I don't know why I'm mad. Well, go ask him. Because he's going to tell you how you function. He's going to tell you what, how your mind gets down. He's going to tell you why your flesh is the way it is. God has already established it, but we need to talk to him. When his word is speaking, the Bible is speaking, that's God dealing with us. We cannot just approach it, okay, I did my good deed for the day, I read the word. No, no, that's not how you eat. I know that's not how you eat. When you eat, when you eat, especially, especially if you, you, you know, you're a professional eater like I am, praise the Lord, uh, when you eat, you want it, you want it right. Don't bring me a cold plate. I need steam coming off that bad boy. And if I ask for gravy, I don't want no little, I want it running. And gravy to me has a little weight to it. It's not water with flavor in it. Y'all, y'all ain't saying nothing. It's a little thick. Hallelujah. And they don't make gravy like they used to. Take the, the skillet with the flour and burn it. Y'all ain't ready. Y'all ain't, y'all ain't ready. You get the package. <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't deal. I can't deal. Look at somebody saying, I want that kind of meal. I don't want the kind of meal that when I'm done with it, I get indigestion. I don't want the kind of meal I, I, when, I, when I'm done, y'all ain't saying nothing, that I get heartburn. I don't, I don't want that kind of meal. I, don't want that, I want the kind of meal that when I'm done, I'm satisfied. And not only am I satisfied, but I don't feel all bloated. I mean, you ate too much. Y'all ain't saying nothing in here. I couldn't help it. It was just good. It was, it was just good. I couldn't stop. And you knew you should have stopped. But they, don't, they only make this once a year. Then you need to learn to make it yourself. <laughs> you need to get some lessons, get the recipe, figure this out. You can't kill yourself once a year. We have to have a balanced meal. Which means we've got to take the word and, and we've got to set it up in a way that's palatable for us. Everybody don't like the same thing. I love Brussels sprouts. Some people don't like Brussels sprouts. I love Brussels sprouts, but you got to prepare them right. Don't bring me this mess I had the other day. Uh, it looked like they were just shredded and took a lighter and went over them. <laughs> they're there they're brussels sprouts but i'm offended <laughs> it's got to be the right way look at somebody say it's got to be the right way and so now trying to get to god and and digesting his word we have to have it palatable it's got to be real somebody say real doesn't make any sense to read the word and it's not real to you. It, it can't be applied to your life. What sense does it make to sit up in church and leave the same way? You ought to get something that ought to change a thought, that ought to move something on the inside of you. Something ought to happen so that you can move to the next place in God. I'm not trying to be religious. I'm not trying to, you know, have people just to have numbers. No, we need to have changed lives. We need to have individuals that are growing in God. Every time they come in the room, they're excited to get here, first of all, because they know the meal is going to be right. Y'all remember, some of y'all don't remember Big Mama. But when Big Mama or, or Grandma or whoever was cooking, y'all know the right cook. I don't know who it was. But when the right cook was cooking, you was in a hurry to get there. Don't, don't play with me. And when it was dinner time, you didn't want to be the last one in line. 
You wanted to be up close to the front so that you can get that plate before everybody rumble through it. Better be some greens when I get up there. Who made the potato salad? But when the meal was right, we was in a hurry to get there. When the meal was right, oh, when the meal was right, we were in a hurry to get there. And there were special things that we were looking for on that table. When, when, you know, I'm a big gravy dude, but around Thanksgiving, I want the gravy with the giblets in it. Some of y'all don't even know what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about that gravy that you pop the top on. I'm not talking. Lord have mercy. Hallelujah. Uh, nothing was wasted. They took the giblets out of the turkey or the chicken. They cut them up. They went in the dressing. They went in the gravy. Hallelujah. Some of them got froze for the gumbo that was going to be had three weeks from now. The bones from the turkey was frozen so that you can make gumbo. I, I don't know how folks eat nowadays. And I think that's part of the problem is that we're malnutrition and we're eating fake food. We're, we're okay with McDonald's. We're okay with fast food. And I think that's the problem is that we want it quick so we can go do what we do. But, but this ain't how God works. God wants to be involved in everything. God wants to be a part of everything. Not just a piece of your life, but, but he wants to be the piece of your life. Everything centered around him. So look at the text when it says, but seek. In other words, there's some work that you have to do. Seek. You got to look for it. I, I, you got to look for it. Uh, when you lose something in your house, you go look for it. And a lot of times you don't stop till you find it. Some of us, us professional eaters, when we really want something, we don't care how many times we got to drive around the city and make phone calls because when we have that taste, we want it. How many here like oxtails? Let me see. Y'all like oxtails? They're expensive. Hallelujah. Uh, and everybody don't sell them. You can't go to Rayleigh's and get oxtails. It's a specialty type of, type of meal. And you got to find a store to be able to do it. But when you want it, you're going to search for it. Some of us going to get online. We're going to give folks telephone numbers. We call, can you transfer me to the meat department, please? All of a sudden, you educated about the, dy the dynamics of the store, and you know how to work because it's something that you desire. Why is it when we get to the word of God, we lummy up? We, we, we just go, we just go completely like, uh, uh, how, how do we do that? If we want to understand God, then we ought to do whatever it takes to be able to understand him. Whatever reference book you need, uh, whatever book you need to buy, wh whatever course you need to take, whatever it takes to be able to get to God, just like you went searching for them oxtails, you ought to be searching for God. <laughs> and, and not just any oxtails, you want the right taste. Anyway, somebody holler, seek. seek. Seek does not mean the seek is over in a week. Well, I didn't find him. You looked for him seven days. I didn't find him. And so now you quit because you didn't find what you were looking for. Sometimes you're looking for a God that does not exist. Because we're trying to put God in our God box. And when he's in our God box, God says, I'm not confined to that. You're not going to find me there because I'm bigger than that. Sometimes we put God in, in religion and we try to find him there. And, and God says, I'm bigger than that. You're not going to find me there. We can't put God in a box, expect him to be there when we want him to be there. Like we pack stuff away, we write God on it, put it in the garage, and, and we go out there when we need him. Where did I put God? I know I put him in here somewhere. Oh, he's buried over there under the Christmas ornaments. God is not the genie in the bottle that you rub him when you want him to pop out. God says either... I'm going to be the core of your life 
or I'm going to be problematic in your life. But God says, I'm going to be a part of your life one way or another. I want you to seek me because if you seek me, you'll find me. I'm not hard to find. Matter of fact, I'm there when you wake up. I was there when you went to sleep, but you never acknowledged me. I'm not hard to find because I'm not, I'm not boxed in by your emotions. I'm not boxed in by your thoughts and your theories of me. The Bible says, I am that I am. I'm God all by myself. Regardless of how you feel, regardless of how you think, I'm God all by myself. And even though you desire a certain relationship with me, it's your life. But it's my way. Somebody holler seek. You have to get out of the thought that you're going to be able to be in God and run your own life. God gave us management. Because if you look at the garden when he created Adam. He said, name the animals, take care of it. He gave us management. He gave us dominion. He gave us authority to manage. Because when it's all said and done, we only attain what he allows us to manage. And when we get something that he didn't give us, a lot of times we mismanage it. Sometimes we get stuff before we're supposed to get it and we mismanage it because God has called us to, to manage or to steward over. Management simply means to steward over. In other words, you have responsibility over this. The first responsibility is not things outside of you. It's you. Your first management is you. Now you want to manage everybody else's life, but you can't manage your own mouth. Y'all, y'all ain't saying nothing in here. You want to tell everybody else how to run their life, but you can't manage your own mouth. Hallelujah. Uh, you, your first job of management is yourself. You ought to be able to put that on your resume. I got managerial experience. Because I learned how to manage my mouth. I learned how to manage my temper. I learned how to manage my lustful desires. I learned how to manage my eyes. I learned how, how to manage my temperament. I learned how to manage my character. Y'all ain't saying amen up in here. Look at your neighbor and, and ask them, are you a good manager? Because I, I don't want you to manage other people until you have the ability to manage yourself. Huh. Are you a good steward over yourself? You know, the Bible, when it talks and it says certain things, it's trying to help us. When you fast, don't look like you fasting. Get up, wash your face, comb your hair. The Bible has given us instructions for management. Do unto others as you want done unto you. It's given us management. Love thy neighbor as thyself. It's given us management. How to manage ourselves so we'll know how to treat other people. But when we don't manage this, I can't expect you to treat me any old kind of way because you haven't done well managing yourself. I learned one time when we were doing some job preparation and I went to this workshop and the workshop taught me something amazing. It said, even if you don't have no interview today, you ought to get up and get dressed and act like you're going to an interview. Because you're getting, you're getting in the mindset of what you're trying to achieve. Uh, my mother always taught me, even when you broke, you act like you got a million dollars in your pocket. 
You, you don't have to walk around in your condition. Y'all hear what I'm saying? You don't have to walk around in your condition. Uh, because w when you look at it, broke is a condition. Poor is a mindset. Hallelujah. And so I might be broke, but you'll never know it. Because I'm not going to tell you. I, and, and even uh, you want to go to dinner and I can't do that today. Uh, got arrangements. The arrangement is with my bank account. <laughs> the way my bank account is set up. <laughs> Don't nobody need to know that. Because we're not defined by the things that we have. We're defined by our character. And a lot of times we try uh, to uh, socialize people by categories based upon what they have. But what they have does not necessarily declare them blessed. Because I know some Christians that got stuff, but they're not blessed. They, they swindled to get it. Hallelujah. And you want everybody to look at you and you driving a Bentley, uh, but they don't know that you can't even open the garage because you couldn't pay your light bill because you're paying for that Bentley. And you didn't know when you bought that Bentley that every year you got to take it in for yearly maintenance. You can't take it to Jiffy Lube. You got to take it back to the dealership. It's $5,000 a year for the maintenance. But you're so worried about how people look at you. Have you counted the cost of what it's going to cost for people to look at you? It costs. It costs. It's very expensive putting up a fake image. It's very costly, and, and, and you have to keep it up. It's almost like a lie. You, you got to remember the lie you told so that when you run into the individuals, you remember the lie and don't get caught up in your own lie. That's too much. One day I just said, forget it. I'm, de I'm, I'm delivered from this. It's too much to try to remember all them lies. This is how it is. If you don't like it, it ain't nothing I could do about it. Because I can't keep up. I can't keep up with my own lies. Somebody holler seek. seek. But seek ye first. first. First is telling us that there is an order to things. That there is some structure. That, that God has put some things in, in sequence. There is sequential order in, in getting to God. When we make it this simple, it really helps us. Because one of the problems that we have is we don't know what it takes to get from A to B. And we want to know the completion of something. Right? When is something actually complete? When am I actually delivered from cussing? When does that really happen? Happens daily. It's just because I was delivered yesterday don't mean that I won't be conquered by a good old cuss word today. Look at somebody and tell them it's an everyday battle. Now, once you whoop on that thing a few times, it becomes easier. But don't get so comfortable because there's no such thing as a slip. That thing is in you. And what happens is you get to a certain place in life, you get under a certain pressure, and pop. Good morning. It comes out. It comes out. It comes out. It comes out. And because we have to govern our flesh every day. Every day, we're going to have challenges. Every day. Now listen, when something happens, when something happens, whatever uh, 
that happened thing is. When something happens, you have to understand that it's not that you weren't delivered. It's just that that thing that came out of you don't want to leave. Remember, I told you it has claimed you. I, I quoted the scripture, when the spirit goes out of a man, it goes seeking rest. When it does not find rest, it says, I will return unto my house. These things that come out of you are dwelling around. They didn't go hook up with somebody else because they were assigned by the devil to you. And so when you get them out, now they're not in you. They're on the outside of you. So you go from possession to influence. Y'all got to catch this. When I wasn't saved and all this stuff and the devil was able to possess me. When I got saved, he had to get out of me. Now that he's out of me, he tried to become an influencer. So he's not in me, but he's at my ear. He's at my ear because he wants to talk at my ear because he wants back inside. I got to get back inside. You going to let her do that to you? I got to get back inside. You going to let your boss talk to you like that? Is that job, is, is it worth the money you getting to get talked to like that? Did he just play you? And the devil is talking at your ear because he's not in you anymore. He's an influencer now. You're not possessed by him, but he can influence you if you don't silence his voice. He's not working any different than he worked when Jesus came into the world and told him, throw yourself off this ledge. Because if you throw yourself off this ledge, I can call angels. You can call angels and you won't hit your foot on the rock. Satan was just talking. In Jesus' ear. And Jesus said, you know what? Get behind me. Uh, uh, you know, you, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And put him in his place. But do we have, we have that example? Is that what we do? Oh, it's difficult. Because when you're in the heat of a moment, whatever that moment is, you know, you're not really thinking about prayer. And so this is why the Bible says that we ought to always pray. Because when you get to a moment where you can't pray, you got to lean on what's already in you. You got to store it up. Look at your neighbor and say, you a trip. You got to store that stuff up. Tell them, tell them, tell them. You got to store prayer up. You ought to be praying every moment you get because you know you a trip. And if you don't store it up, you're not going to have nothing to be able to produce when the devil come at you because he's coming. Oh, he's coming for you. I don't know who told you when you got saved that the devil was just going to leave you alone because you so anointed. No, he hates you. And the more anointed you get, the more he hates you. He don't want you to have power. He don't want you to have anointing. So he want to influence you to push your own anointing out so that he can control you. You can't have this. I'm seeking God. You can't have me. I'm seeking God. You can't, you can't have me. I want God's order in my life. Somebody holler order. This is the problem. Why a lot of us can't get to God because we want fancy free and foot loose. But God is about order. God is about order. He wants first order in your mind. He don't want five and six voices going on in your head. That's why he said, my sheep know my voice. Because if there's going to be a voice in there, it need to be my voice. Sometimes you even need to be quiet. Just stop talking and let God deal with it. Sometimes we just talk entirely too much. Look at your name and say, sometimes you need to be quiet. See, I did better because normally I'd tell you, tell your neighbor to shut up. Look at your neighbor and tell him, sometimes we need to be quiet. We need to be quiet sometimes. We need to be quiet sometimes. We need to be quiet sometimes. Sometimes some things don't even deserve a response because we were taught in the world that we don't, you don't talk to me like that. Sometimes ignorance does not require a response. Silence sometimes. 
is the best answer. I don't need to feed that demon. I don't need to put fuel on the fire. If I'm seeking God and not seeking my way, then sometimes I'm going to have to be in a place of humility. It's not about uh, me just being played. When am I going to give up the world? Well, I can't give it up because they still playing. They still sinning. So why ain't they going to still be playing? God is going to give you wisdom. Sometimes we get played because we con- too tight and too connected to people that we don't have no business being connected with. If you to discern in the first place, God, is this somebody I'm supposed to be hooking up with? They want to go to lunch. What spirit is behind that? What's your motive? What's your intention? What's your agenda? You've been trying to take me to lunch. I need to figure that out. Hallelujah. I like to eat, but I ain't going to let you play on me. Praise the Lord. God, is this a meal I need to eat or do I need to fast? I can't go with you today. Got something scheduled. Fasting. (laughs) But seek ye first. Somebody holler order, order, order. There must be order. First in your mind, then order can come out of you. But if you don't have no order, you can't help nobody else get in order. I know you may know how to do it, but until you do it, you can't show nobody else. I love how I was taught motor skills. Before I learned how to play dominoes, I was playing with dominoes. I wasn't playing the game of dominoes. I was lining them up and knocking them down. And I would always put one at the end of the counter because at the end, I wanted a grand finale. I see a domino go flying. But I would get frustrated when my mother or whoever was playing with me would set them up for me. I pushed their hands out the way. I'll never forget it. Couldn't really talk, but I pushed their hands out the way because I wanted to try to set it up. And it would take me forever because, you know, I hadn't done it before. And I get it set up and I get about five of them and then I'd make a move too quick and they they all knock down. I had to start over. Sometimes I would get frustrated and I would remember, don't get frustrated. Try again. This is what happens in our life. We'll get so far. We got things stacked up. It's in order, but we make a quick move and everything gets knocked down. And all of a sudden we want to blame God and get mad at God when we made a move too fast. Every door that opens is not God opening a door. And sometimes we think, it must be God. It's come down my path. No, you can't do that. Stop blaming everything on God. And see, if you were in constant communication with God, when that door went open, he'd have told you, don't do that. Wisdom is the principal thing. And in all thy getting, get an understanding. Why would I go and get a car that I know I can't afford? Oh, the Lord is blessing me with a, with a Mercedes Benz 550 SD with peanut butter interior. You know the first thing I'm going to ask? How much? Why? Because God gave me wisdom. Man, did that before. Here's a car. Here's a car. No, I got to use wisdom now. How much is it? Hmm. Nah, I think I'm going to pass. Well, you don't even have to have good credit. We're going to give it to you. I'm sure you will with like a 23% interest rate. So you're going to rob me on the back end. So I'm going to get into it for nothing. But on the back end, you're going to rob me. But I'm just excited because I think God is blessing me. No, God, when God bless you, it ain't no interest. It's just a key. The blessings of the Lord make it rich and added. You know what the sorrow is? Why did I buy this car? When you call the insurance company and they say, make and model, and you proud. Mercedes Benz 500 SD. And that insurance guy is on the other side like, ooh. 
And they send you that quote and you're like, wait a minute. Uh, can we take some of this off? Nope, it was finance. And any car that's finance has to have full cup. Oh, y'all know what's going on here. <laughs> Look at your name and say, just because you get knocked down don't mean God don't love you. Some, sometime we made a quick move. And it wasn't in the order of God. So God allow us to make that quick move. It knocks everything down. Because God wants us to start over. Because we didn't get the lesson. You cannot advance. If you don't hear nothing else tonight. You cannot advance without learning the lesson. You cannot advance without learning the lesson. First you seek the kingdom of God. Now, when you get to the kingdom of God, this is a whole nother place here. Because the kingdom of God, say this with me, the kingdom of God, kingdom of God is, the is the rule of God and the reign of God, reign of God. in my life. You got to be excited about that. The kingdom of God, kingdom of God. is the rule, the rule of God and the reign of God, reign of God. In, my in my life. I cannot attain the kingdom Without first applying the kingdom principle number one, God is first. If it's God's kingdom, how can he not be first? So how can I experience the, the blessings of the kingdom without first acknowledging the king? I want to go into the kingdom and I want to shop at the kingdom store and I want the kingdom stuff and I want kingdom benefits and I'm a child of the king, but I don't acknowledge the king. I'm blessed and highly favored. Can't you see the favor upon me? But you've never been to see the king. And you got on yesterday's garment. You can't function in yesterday's garment. See, if you'd have talked to the king this morning, the king would have told you that blue was yesterday. Yellow is today. But you still rocking blue and you think you doing something. You prophesying and praying for folks and you out of line. Because what you did yesterday was good for yesterday. What are you doing today? kingdom of God now is is promises it's promises if you seek the kingdom of God and then secondly his righteousness now let's deal with righteousness we understand what the kingdom of God is uh, but now uh, let's understand his righteousness I don't know if I'm gonna have time for that uh, because the kingdom of God now uh, is explained by Jesus in, in so many parables, it was ridiculous. He never really gave a straight answer. He would say the kingdom of God is likened unto. The kingdom of God is likened unto. Because he was trying to set us up to show us that the kingdom of God uh, uh, builds character and delivers promises. So in other words, you cannot get the promise without building the character. Uh, Y'all ain't with me tonight. It's too quiet in here, and I'm sweating. I'm working hard. Thank you, Sister Fontenot, for saying amen. Because I'm working tonight, and y'all ain't saying nothing. Hallelujah. Uh, without building the character, you cannot obtain the promise. Because you can't handle the promise without the character. And so God takes us through the process of building character with a bunch of ifs. If you do this, I will do this. One of the reasons why we don't grow in faith is because we don't do our part. We have to do our part. And then God responds. Now, here's the tricky part. Because... Uh, Many of us think, well, I did my part. Yeah, but you did it with the wrong intent. 
And when your intention isn't right, God can't give you the promise because you didn't build the character. You just did it as an obligation and it didn't come out of the right place of your heart. You just did it to try to get a response. That's juvenile. That's like your mama, your mama. We're provoking a response. You can't provoke God to move on a promise when the promise is predicated upon your character. You had a question. Right. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I, I know. Well, I love my niece to pieces. Y'all know. I love her like she's my own daughter. I know when my niece is getting ready to ask me for something. I know it. I know it. Because all of a sudden, she go in this sweet mode. How was your day, uncle? I know what's coming. I know what's coming. And then, and then she sets it up. You know, I was thinking... I know ice cream or something is coming, right? Uh, real quick, uh, go to First Peter because I, I want to respond to what you're saying. Uh, First Peter, uh, chapter one, and verse thirteen. Let's let's go there real quick. Look at your neighbor while you while you're flipping the page and say, "Character produces promise." Mm. God, I, I hope you chewing now. That one has some flavor in it. Hallelujah. That was some Lare season salt in that one. First Peter chapter one, verse 13. Look at this. It says, wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. So if you're going to live this, this holy life or have a relationship with God, the first thing you got to do is get your mind covered, get your mind made up, establish your mind because everything is going to come at you because the real battle is happening in your mind. It ain't even in your flesh. The first place, your flesh can't do nothing. Your mind hasn't conjured up. Well, folks say, I'm struggling, I'm struggling, I'm struggling. You're supposed to struggle. Stop looking at struggle as a negative thing that I might know him in the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his suffering. You got to stop looking at going through is a bad thing. Going through is taking me to the place of promise because it's developing character in me. I got to go through this. Thank God it's coming up on my life, but I got to get my mind right to be able to handle what God is getting ready to put on me. Oh, cause it's coming. God says, I have promises for you. I want to bless you, but in order for me to bless you, I got to work on your character. It's coming. We're asking. Now watch this, because this is going to bless somebody's life. We're asking God for the promises, but when God answers, he doesn't answer with promise. He answers with the trial. That builds the character that delivers the promise. Y'all don't like me tonight. It's all right. It's all right. God, God, take me to the level that you want me to be. Okay, I was waiting for you to ask that trial that's going to take them to the level that they want to be. You up. You on deck. We've been waiting for him to go trial. God, why am I going through all this? Wait, 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 I'm not confused. You confused. You just asked me to take you to the level that you want me to be. I sent the trial that's going to develop the character to be able to produce the promise that you asked me for. And now you upset because you don't like the process. I think we got it twisted. We want God's hand. We don't want God's heart. We don't want God's wisdom. We just want the stuff that he could give to us. 
But you got to go whoo, you got to go through some stuff to be able to handle what God is trying to give you. And I know you thought you was ready, but God says, what I have for you, you're not ready. You're not ready. I got to take you through a whole lot of stuff before you can handle what I'm getting ready to bless you with. Because you asked me for a million. I'm going to fool around and give you a billion. But I got to take you through some stuff so that you can handle this blessing that I'm getting ready to put on you. The deeper the trial, the closer I get to the promise. The deeper the trial, the closer I get to the promise. That's why the trial don't kill me. Because I know if I stay the course in the trial, I might not be the strongest in the trial. I might not be, you know, all that in the trial, but I'm going through it. Saying, it's not saying you're going to be perfect in the trial. He takes you through the trial so he can show you what's in you so that we could do some corrective actions. Trial can whoop, messed up. Let's correct it. I'm getting closer to the promise. I'm getting closer to the promise because now I see you didn't know it was out of whack till the trial came. I thought I was delivered. You were from one level, but he had to bring another level. That was just the entry level. Y'all know I've been delivered from levels of anger, you know, so I know it's a, it's a whole lot of levels. And when I was thought I was delivered from one level, he threw smart and final at me. Y'all ain't going to say nothing right there. And I thought all that was out of me. But God said, no, it's still there. And where I'm getting ready to take you, I got to challenge your character so that you can develop the character necessary to be able to handle the promise. So although you fail, don't mean that it's all all over. I'm just showing you so I could bless you. You can't go all off slapping folks and doing crazy stuff. God is trying to take us to the promise. Look at your neighbor and say, he's trying to take you there. He's trying to take you there. Trying to take you there. Tell him he's trying to take you there. You got to talk to him. Trying to take you there. Talk to your neighbor. Tell him he's trying to take you there. He's trying trying to take you there. Now tell him you got to get your mind in order. You got to you got to get your mind in order. You got to get your mind right. Talk to him because they going through some stuff. Talk to him. They got situations. Talk to him. They got stuff going and they want to blame the devil. But it's God trying to move them to promise. Gird up the loins of your mind. Get your mind together. And then he says, be sober. In other words, don't be moved by everything. Don't get bent out of shape about everything. Don't let your emotions get all tied up because somebody said something. Don't fly off the hook because everybody else is crazy. Be sober. You, you, you got to calm down. You got to bring it down 10 ticks. You can't, what? What did you say? What? Why do you want confirmation about taking off on somebody? Because that's exactly what's going to happen. I know what the what means. The what means I want to make sure I heard you right before I take off on you. Being sober says, I'm dealing with somebody that either need healing, got a demon, got some problems, something's going on, and I don't need to immediately respond to what this is. Be slow to speak. Say it. Be slow to speak. Quick to listen. Slow to wrath. The Bible is right. Sometimes you need to sit back, see what's going on. Uh, folk come, man, such and such, this and such, such, you have come over here. Hold up. What am I about to walk into? No, I don't think I'm coming. That's between y'all. I thought we was homies. We are. So I'm going to give you a pass for calling me on your foolishness. Somebody holler, be sober. And hope till the end for the grace that is to be brought onto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. If I gird up the loins of my mind and I'm sober and my hope is in Jesus Christ, that unmerited favor, that free, free gift, I'm able to produce character that I wasn't able to produce before. I'm trying to get God first in my life. I, I, I'm trying to get God first. Somebody say it. I'm trying to get God first in my life. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. 
And I got to move out of the way if he's going to be first. I got to move if he's going to be first. I got to quit, y'all. I got to quit. But let me, let me just read these two script, three scriptures, and I'm going to let you go. It's, it, we're already over time. As obedient children, not fastening yourselves according to the former lusts, in your ignorance, you didn't know no better. But as he which is, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be holy. In all, and here's how. Because some folks say, I don't know how to be holy. Here's how. In all manner of conversation. That word conversation is talking about lifestyle. It's not necessarily talking about what's coming out your mouth. It's talking about how you conduct your life. Because as it is written, be holy, for I am holy. Holiness is not difficult when you work on it. And you try to understand what character God is trying to deal with and work on when you're going through. Oh, this is a lesson on patience. So let me just be cool. I want it right now. I'm frustrated. I don't understand it. But let me sit still. Because this is a lesson right here on patience. And you have to remember that when it gets thick and you want to throw in the towel, you want to act up. Hmm, let me be cool. Say this with me. My life, My life. God's, way. God's way. Come on, give the Lord a hand of praise on tonight. <laughs> we got work to do in this book, y'all. And so I encourage you if you have... Have not, I'm still in the first chapter. If anybody that was reading, uh, you'll know I'm still in the first chapter. I haven't gone anywhere. Uh, it's too much to deal with in the first chapter to just run through it and go to chapter two just so we can say we've been through it. This whole God, the God first life is very uh, strategic and important. So, again, if you have not purchased the book, I encourage you to purchase it, get it. Uh, you can download it on, off of Amazon onto your Kindle. Uh, you can listen to it. There's an audio app on, on Amazon that you can download. Uh, if you don't have time to read it, you can listen to it. There is no excuse. We need to invest in ourselves. Amen. 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 This is how we're going to attain spiritual uh, maturity. All right. Clap your hands one more time and give him praise. We